Hello everyone. I want to share with you today about the Bible and why the Bible is unique. We can't prove that the Bible is the Word of God, but there are things that make the Word of God special. And I hope you're getting into the Bible in your Christian life. You know, if you read just four chapters a day, you'll get through the whole Bible in less than a year. But yeah, I'm, I'm surprised of how many Christians have never read the Bible. Even Christians who've been a Christian for a long time, some of them have never read through the whole thing. And, uh, you know, sometimes I meet Christians, I'm just surprised. One time in my church, I was talking to the wife of our youth pastor, and she was pregnant, and she mentioned that she was going to name the baby Jonathan. And I said, oh, it's great that you're naming your baby after a character in the Bible. And she said, Jonathan's in the Bible? <laughs> you know, she didn't know a, a youth pastor's wife. A lot of people, what they do is they take kind of a random approach you know they read this thing and then they read that thing and but it's better if we're able to read more straight through and we get the whole context of of the bible you know so have you ever heard about that person who just would point to different verses and figure out god's will for his life you know one day he opened the bible and he uh, pointed to a verse and it said and judas went and hung himself Oh, well, that can't be God's, God's, God's will for me. I'll try it again. So he pointed to another verse and it said, Go now and do you likewise. <laughs> thought, oh, well, that can't be God's will. I better try this a third time. So he pointed to another verse and it said, What you are about to do, do it quickly. So we don't want to uh, find God's will in that sort of random way, usually, right? It's better to read straight through. Uh, I had I heard a story about DTS in um, Shillong many years ago, and the teacher said, "Please turn to the book of Jonah." And so one student was looking and looking and said, "Jonah's not in my Bible." <laughs> or I had another friend; she was a Christian. Her mother was a Christian. Her father was an atheist. He did not believe in God. So when she was born, there was an argument about what to name her. Her mother wanted to give her a Christian name, but her father did not. And finally, after a time, the father got very, uh, very angry and said, look, we are not going to give her a name from the Bible. We are going to name her Mary, and that's final. And that's what they named her. So anyway, we want to have better biologists than that. So get into the Word of God and know that it is rational to believe this book. It is a step of faith into the light to believe in the Bible. So we're going to go through some different aspects showing why the Bible is unique. What makes it so special above other books? What makes it what? makes it trustworthy, something that we can see it's not irrational to put our faith in God's Word. So I think you'll enjoy. Number one, the first aspect that makes the Bible unique and special is the unity of the books of the Bible. How many books are there in the Bible? Sixty-six. And as we read through these 66 different books, there are different aspects of unity. They flow together, and this really is a miracle. Yeah, so the Bible is not just one book. It is 66 different books. And these 66 books were written by over 40 authors. And these were different kinds of people. Some were kings, like King David or King Solomon. Uh, some were fishermen, like Peter. 
We know that Luke, for example, was a doctor. Some were prophets. Uh, Matthew was a tax collector. So 40 different authors, and these are different kinds of people. And we know that the Bible was written over a span of 1,500 years, 1,500 years. So in other words, from the time Moses wrote uh, until the time that uh, the Apostle John wrote, that was a span of about 1,500 years. Uh, these books were written in different places. They were written in three different continents. Some were written in Africa, some were written in Asia, and some were written in Europe. Also, these books, different ones of them, were written in different languages. Some were written in Aramaic, which was like an old form of Hebrew. Then some were written in the more modern Hebrew of the time. And then some were written in Greek. And then these authors of these books wrote in different circumstances. Some wrote in times of war. Some in times of peace, some in times of prosperity, some in times of famine. And you know, the, the mood that you're in, the different, the different um, circumstances that you're in can greatly influence uh, what you might write. And then the authors wrote on many controversial topics. Yeah, a controversial topic is something that people don't usually agree on, like uh, economics or politics or, you know, these sort of things. And they wrote on many controversial topics, right? So the miracle is, as you read through the Bible, it flows, doesn't it? Sometimes we even forget it's 66 different books. It just flows from Genesis to Revelation. It's an incredible unity. And that is a miracle. I heard about a salesman who came to one house and he was selling a series of books called the Greatest Book Series. You know, like a hundred different books by Tagore and Shakespeare and Milton and different famous authors. And the house he went to had some Christians there. And um, the Christians asked him, if we read your hundred books, would they agree with each other? And the salesman said, no, they, they totally, many of them would disagree with each other. Then they shared about the 66 books of the Bible that, that just flow and work together and agree. And this man ended up accepting Christ. Unity is a very un amazing thing about the Bible. Number two is manuscript reliability. Manuscript reliability is basically looking at things like, how do we know that what, say, the Apostle Paul wrote, or what Moses wrote, is the same thing that we have today in all the copying and recopying? How would you know the manuscripts are reliable for what we're reading today. Number two, manuscript reliability. Have you ever played that game of telephone? If you haven't, maybe you guys can, can play it now. What you do is you have a person whisper, kind of a complicated Bible verse or some few sentences that are have different details. They whisper that to another person. And then that person immediately has to go and whisper it to the next person. And the next person whispers that to the next person. And it passes down the line between 20, 30 people. And then you ask the last person, what was the message? 
And it's always completely different <laughs> from what the original message was. And some people think, some critics of the Bible will think that the Bible has acted like the game of telephone. In other words, say Moses or the Apostle Paul would write down something, you know, write a letter or a book of the Bible. And we don't have that. We don't have the original thing the Apostle Paul wrote, for example. We don't have that manuscript. It, it disintegrated and has been passed on. But we have some old manuscripts, but there's always a gap between what the manuscript we have and when that person wrote. And we have to trust that in that time, as it was passed from person to person to person and different scribes wrote it, that it didn't get changed like in telephone. They call this manuscript reliability. Uh, and, and, and they evaluate all different historical manuscripts this way. And what they look at is when it was written, then the earliest copy of, that they have of, of that document, and the time gap between when the person originally wrote and the earliest copy we have. Because we have to trust over that number of years, it didn't change very much. And then we have the number of copies. You know, if you have more copies of a manuscript, that's better. Because if someone, some copyist made a mistake, uh, you would you would find it because you would see all oh, nine tenths of these nine say this and this one says that. You said, no, that one went off course. And so the more copies you have, the more you can compare them to each other and really find um, what's reliable. So let's look at some famous people who wrote manuscripts and their works and see how reliable they are. Julius Caesar, emperor of Rome, right? Now, he wrote in the year 100 BC, before Christ. The earliest, oldest copy we have of his works are from 900 AD. That's a time gap of 1,000 years. So we have to trust that over that 1,000 years, as this manuscript was copied and recopied a number of times, that it did not change from the time of Julius Caesar. Uh, we have 10 copies of it. So we, we at least have 10 to compare with each other. All right? And yet, people don't dispute that Julius Caesar wrote these things. They accept it. Well, we can look at some others. Plato, you've heard of that famous philosopher, Plato. Now, he wrote about 347 B.C., the earliest copy of his works are from 900 A.D. That's a time gap of 1,200 years that we have to trust. It didn't change. And we have 20 copies. That's a little better, so we can compare those. Okay? And people accept Plato, his works. Sophocles, another Greek philosopher, he wrote 405 B.C., before Christ. And his, the earliest copy of his works are from 1000 A.D. A.D. is Anno Domini, the year of our Lord. So that's a thousand years after Christ. So we have a time gap of 1,400 years that we are trusting that it didn't change during that copying and recopying. The number of copies, 100. That's a little better, right? We can compare them. Then we can look at Aristotle. Uh, 322 BC is when he wrote. The earliest copy, the earliest manuscript we have is 1100 AD. That's also a gap of about 1,400 years. We only have five copies of that, so less to compare with each other. All right. Now we can compare these historical works with the New Testament. In this Look at manuscript reliability. How reliable is the New Testament? Well, the New Testament was a number of different books written between 50 and 95 AD, approximately. 
The earliest copies we have of those books were ranging between 85 and 125 AD. And so the time gap between when these people originally wrote and the documents we have now, the manuscripts, is 30 to 40 years. Much better than all these other manuscripts. And how many copies do we have to compare with each other? 24,000. So the New, New Testament by manuscript reliability standards is very reliable. But what about um, the Old Testament? Now, the Old Testament, of course, was written further back. There's a much larger gap between when Moses wrote and the earliest copies we have. But we have to look at another aspect, and that is the uh, very careful way that the Talmudists, the scribes, worked. Now, in a game of telephone, we just quickly whisper it to each other, and it's passed from person to person. But these scribes were incredibly meticulous when they copied one manuscript to some new parchment. Okay, they were very careful and there were strict rules they had to follow these Jewish scribes when they did this. Now, you don't have to write these down. I just want to give you the general idea that it was very carefully done. But these were the disciplines of the Talmudists. These are the rules that they had to go by when they were copying an old scripture to a new parchment. Okay. A synagogue roll must be written on the skin of clean animals. That skin must be paired for that use by a Jew. Each skin must have a certain number of columns equal throughout. The length of each column must not be less than 48 or more than 60 lines. Breadth must consist of 60 letters. The whole copy must be lined first. The ink should be black and prepared according to a specific recipe. The scribe must copy from a reliable manuscript. They must not deviate at all. No word or letter, not even a yod, that's like a dot of an eye, can be written from memory. Between every consonant, the space of a hair or thread must intervene. Between every parasol or section, the breadth of nine consonants. Between every book, three lines. The fifth book of Moses must terminate exactly with a line, the rest need not do so. The copyist must sit in full Jewish dress. He must wash his body the whole before each time. He must not begin to write the name of God with a pen newly dipped in ink. If a king addresses him while writing the name of God, he must take no notice of him. Also, some scribe numbered verses and words and letters in each book, and they would know the middle letter, the middle time, the number of times each letter was in each book, and so on. The Talmudists were so convinced that when they had finished transcribing a manuscript that they had an exact duplicate, that they would give the new copy equal authority. Older copies were put in the cupboard, used for teaching children, eventually buried in jars. New copies were actually considered more important. So you see how carefully they had to do this. So you can imagine it would take forever. I mean, in this game of telephone, people just whisper it quickly. But in real life, when they copied the manuscripts, they would look at each letter as they copied it to make sure they were doing it correctly. I imagine it could take weeks or months or years to complete different manuscripts. In fact, um, there was a Xerox commercial that made fun of this aspect that it took so long for these scribes to copy their scriptures into new manuscripts. So I'll show you that commercial. Ever since people started recording information, there's been a need to duplicate it. Very nice work, Brother Dominic. Thank you. Very nice. Now, I would like 500 more sets.
Brother Dominic, how are you? Could you do a big job for me? The Xerox 9200 duplicating system, unlike anything we've ever made, feeds and cycles originals, has a computerized programmer that controls the entire system, can duplicate, reduce, and assemble a virtually limitless number of complete sets, and does it all at an incredible two pages per second. Here are your sets, Father. The 500 sets you asked for. It's a miracle. So while they didn't have Xerox machines back in those days, they were very careful and meticulous as they copied these scriptures. And that's why we can trust that, um, that they did not change in that time. For example, uh, the book of Isaiah. Now, for many years, the oldest copy that we had of the book of Isaiah was from 900 AD. Then the Dead Sea Scrolls were found with Isaiah copy from 125 BC. So that was over a thousand years difference. And so they were able to compare these two to see how much had changed in a thousand years. They found they were 95% the same. And the other 5% was only things like spelling differences or conjunctions, like today or today. You know, a few decades ago, they used to say two dash day, but it's the same meaning. And that's the only difference they found. So it's amazing in a thousand years, they didn't see change. Now, some people wonder, well, Adam lived a 6,000 years ago. And we have the story of Adam and Eve and creation, and yet the first oldest book of the Bible might be the one written by Moses, perhaps Job, we don't know, but one of the oldest books is written by Moses, and he's the one that wrote about, he is the one that wrote about Adam. So there's quite a difference there between when Moses lived and when Adam lived. But we have to remember that people used to live longer. Have you noticed that? When you read the Bible, you will find that people who lived before the flood of Noah lived to be 900 years, 800 years. Very, they lived very long. And so these traditions could be easily passed down from generation to generation. For example, Adam lived long enough to where he could have met Lamech who was Noah's father, okay? And Noah, he lived long enough to where he could have met Abraham. So the, the generational gap is not as much, I mean, the age gap, it shows that these people could have met each other. Plus they had all these years to write things down. So actually the books that Moses wrote, like Genesis, it was not the first book ever written. It's likely that Moses took from sources that had already written about the creation of, of man and so on, things that happened before the time of Moses, okay? But some people say, what about the contradictions in the Bible? And that is when you read two different Bible verses or a number of Bible verses and they seem to contradict. They have a different version of events from each other. And uh, we've had anti-Christian professors in universities saying, oh, the Bible is full of contradictions. But yet, if you look closer and study things closer, you will find there are verses that look like they might contradict, but once you study them, you realize there's a way they can fit together. So I'm going to give you some examples of that. Uh, one is two creation accounts. In Genesis 1 and in Genesis 2, there are two different accounts of creation. And some people look at them and say, oh, they seem to give a different order of things. For example, in Genesis chapter 1, 24 to 26, and God said, let the lamb produce living creatures according to their kinds, the livestock, the creatures that move along the ground, 
the wild animals, each according to its kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals according to their kinds, the livestock according to their kinds, and all the creatures that move along the ground according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let us make mankind in our own image, in our own likeness, so that they may rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky and over the livestock and the wild animals and over the creatures that move along the ground. So there we see a creation account that seems to say that God created animals and then man. Now, you look at Genesis chapter 2, 18 to 19. The Lord God said, It is not good for man to be alone. I will make a, a, suit, a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground the wild animals and the birds in the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each creature, that was his name. Now there it seems to talk about man and then the animals. And, and it depends on the Bible version you're reading. But some really make it appear that that God created man and then the animals here. But if you read it carefully, and if you have a good version, you'll notice it says, now the Lord, in 19, now the Lord God had formed out of the ground. See, that's something he did before. He brought them to man to see what he would name them. So what happened is God made the animals, then he made man and woman, and then he brought the animals to them, to Adam, to, to, to see what he would name them. So they fit together, these two creation accounts. Uh, here's another one. Now we know that God created Adam and Eve. And that Adam and Eve had their sons, Cain and Abel. And that Cain killed Abel. But then we read in Genesis 4, 17, Cain made love to his wife, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Enoch. Cain was then building a city, and he named it after his son Enoch. Well, then, you know, people would wonder, where did Cain get his wife? <laughs> you know, uh, wait a minute, wh where did she come from? And uh, I have asked this to different DTSs and for their ideas, and someone once even suggested, well, maybe aliens came, <laughs> and that's how uh, Cain got his wife. Well, no, actually, the answer is given to us, and if you've been reading the Bible, you, re you may remember. Genesis 5-4 says, after Seth was born, Adam lived 800 years and had other sons and daughters. So basically, uh, Cain married, he could have married his sister, his niece, you know, something, something like that. And marrying close relatives was allowed back in those days because the gene pool was pure. Not until the time of Moses were people not uh, allowed to marry close relatives. Here's another one. How did King Saul die? Remember, King Saul was wounded in battle, and then, you know, he died. But how, there's, there's two different versions of how exactly did King Saul's die. And one comes from 1 Samuel 31, 1 to 5. And uh, it says, Now the Philistines fought against Israel. The Israelites fled before them, and many fell dead on Mount Gilboa. The Philistines were in hot pursuit of Saul and his sons, and they killed his sons, Jonathan, Abinadab, and Malkishua. The fighting grew fierce around Saul, and when the archers overtook him, they wounded him critically. Saul said to his armor-bearer, Draw your sword and run me through, or these uncircumcised fellows will come and run me through and abuse me. But his armor-bearer was terrified and would not do it. So Saul took his own sword and fell on it. Then the armor-bearer saw that Saul was dead. He, too, fell on his sword and died with him. So according to this um, 
this story, King Saul killed himself, right? He was wounded and uh, he figured he wasn't going to make it. So he basically fell on his own sword. But then we have another story. This is from 2 Samuel, chapter 1, 1 to 16. After the death of Saul, David returned from striking down the Amalekites and stayed in Zitlag two days. On the third day, a man arrived from Saul's camp with his clothes torn and dust on his head. When he came to David, he fell to the ground to pay him honor. Where have you come from? David asked him. He, he answered, I have escaped from the Israelite camp. What happened? David asked. Tell me. The, man, the men fled from the battle, he replied. Many of them fell and died, and Saul and his son Jonathan are dead. Then David said to the young man who brought him the report, How do you know that Saul and his son Jonathan are dead? I happen to be on Mount Gilboa, the young man said. And there was Saul, leaning on his spear, with the chariots and their drivers in hot pursuit. Then he turned around and saw me. He called to me and said, and I said, what can I do? He asked me, who are you? An Amalekite, I answered. Then he said to me, stand here by me and kill me. I am in the throes of death, but I'm still alive. So I stood beside him and I killed him because I knew that after he had fallen, he could not survive. And I took the crown that was on his head and the band on his arm, and I brought them here to my Lord. Then David and the men with him took hold of their clothes and tore them. They mourned and wept and fasted till evening for Saul and his son Jonathan, and for the army of the Lord and for the nation of Israel, because he had, they had fallen by the sword. David said to the young man who had brought him the report, what is your, uh, Where are you from? I am a son of a foreigner, an Amalekite, he answered. David asked him, Why weren't you afraid to lift your hand to destroy the Lord's anointed? Then David called one of his men and said, Go strike him down. For he struck, for so he struck him down and he died. For David had said to him, Your blood be on your own head. Your own mouth testified against you when you said, I have killed the Lord's anointed. Okay. So the question is, what really went on here? You know, did Saul kill himself or did, or did, um, did the Amalekite kill Saul? Well, the answer is King Saul killed himself because the, the Bible says that very plainly, that King, call, King Saul uh, killed himself in 2 Samuel 1, 1 to 16. Um, no, I'm sorry, in, um, in, the, in 1 Samuel 31, 1 to 5. That's where it says that King, it plainly says that King, call, King Saul killed himself. What we read in 2 Samuel 1, 1 to 16 is the story the Amalekite told. And so basically, the Amalekite was lying. Uh, and he did not, in fact, kill Saul. Obviously, he wanted honor. Typically, if you killed your enemy, if you killed the enemy of someone, you would be rewarded. He thought he'd be rewarded by David for killing Saul. Little did he know of the respect that David gave to Saul even though Saul had been persecuting him. It doesn't really make that much sense that the Amalekite could have killed Saul anyway, because who was with King Saul? His armor bearer. His armor bearer didn't kill himself until after Saul killed himself. And the job of the armor bearer is to make sure no one touches the king. So no armor bearer would allow the enemy, an Amalekite, to come and kill the person he's protecting. So there's no way that that Amalekite could get close uh, to King Saul to kill him. Now, chances are he was in the area and he probably did hear King Saul asking for help to be killed, but he couldn't get, he couldn't do it. And only after King Saul killed himself, 
and the armor bearer killed himself, then that Amalekite could have crept up and grabbed the, uh, the crown and taken it away. So basically there's no contradiction there. Uh, the Amalekite only said that's what happened, but that's not what happened. Okay, then we can look at the um, genealogies of Jesus. And there's two genealogies listed, one in Matthew, one in Luke, and they seem to contradict each other. Matthew 1, 15, 16, to, uh, 1, 15 to 16. Uh, uh, now, this is just part of the genealogy, but the last part contradicts like the whole one does. But there it says, Eliud, the father of Eleazar, Eleazar, the father of Matan, Matan, the father of Jacob, Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, and Mary was the mother of Jesus who had called the Messiah. Uh, Luke 3.23, the 24a. Now, Jesus himself was about 30 years old when he began his ministry. He was a son, so was thought, of Joseph, the son of Heli, the son of Matat, the son of Levi, the son of Melchi, the son of Jani, the son of Joseph. And you see, those genealogies are very different. Because according to Matthew, the lineage would have gone from Iliad to Eliezer, Matan to Jacob, who was the father of Joseph, and humanly speaking, the father of Jesus. And Luke lists Melchi, and then Levi, the father of Matai, the father of Heli, Heli, the father of Joseph. The, so, so Joseph seems to have two fathers and different grandfathers, and the whole thing just seems to contradict. How is this possible? Well, some things in the Bible are more understandable if you understand the culture of that time. And in the Jewish culture, Things always passed through the men. Okay? So Matthew lists Joseph's family line. And Luke lists, lists Mary's family line. Because geneal with genealogies and inheritances, you never pass things through the woman. You always, in the Jewish culture, would pass things through the man. And so... In the case of <clears throat> of um, of Mary, uh, her the, the the genealogy what was passed Mary's genealogy was passed through Joseph, and this is because Mary's father had two daughters, Mary and the wife of Zebedee. We see that in John nineteen twenty five. And so because Mary's father had two daughters and he, he needed to pass on his family line, pass on his inheritance, he couldn't do it in his daughter's name in their culture. He had to do it through her husband's name. And that's why Joseph is listed in Mary's genealogy. Uh, this makes more sense if you look at, we don't have time to look up these verses. You can look them up later on. But one time, uh, in the time of Moses, uh, some women came to Moses and said, look, we, our father has this inheritance and we have no brothers. Can we keep the inheritance? Because why should our, our inheritance be taken away from our family, even, even, even though we have no brothers? And so Moses said, yes, you, the inheritance can pass to the daughters if there are no sons. But then some people came to Moses and said, wait a minute, if the inheritance of land and so on passes to the daughters, and they marry someone of a, of a different tribe, then that land and that territory could be taken away from our tribe. And so Moses made the rule, yes, the inheritance can pass to the daughters, but they must marry within their own tribe. And that's why Joseph and Mary were from the same clan, the same tribe because of this situation. So then it makes sense. One was Joseph's family line and one was Mary's family line reckoned through Joseph. So there's no contradiction really. 
Here's another one. And that is, what happened to Saul at Damascus? Remember the, the conversion of Saul to Damascus where he was on a horse and Jesus, you know, the great light came to him and he was knocked off his horse. And, you know, what really happened there? There's two different versions of what the other men with Saul experienced in this. In Acts 9, 3 to 7. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? The Lord said, I am Jesus, who you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Then the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no one. Now, Acts 22, 6 to 9. Now, it happened as I journeyed, is when, when Paul, the Apostle Paul, was still telling the story of his conversion. Now, it happened as I, as I journeyed and came near Damascus about noon. Suddenly, a light from heaven shone all around me. And I fell to the ground, and I heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? So I answered, Who are you, Lord? He said to me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. And those who were with me indeed saw the light and were afraid, but they did not hear the voice of him who spoke to me. Now, you see, there's a little difference there between the two versions. Uh, one, the first one says, And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no one. And the next, in Acts, it says that uh, those who were with me saw the light and were afraid, but did not hear the voice of one who spoke to me. So it seems like in one, they heard the sound, but didn't see. The other one, they didn't see. And they, you know, What's going on here? Did they see or did they hear? And you look at Acts 9, 3 to 7, and Acts 22, 6 to 9, and it's what happened as you look closer to this is that in Acts 9, the men with Saul heard the sound, but did not see anyone. So what that means is they heard a sound, but didn't see a person. And Acts 22 says the men with Saul saw the light, but did not understand the voice. So basically, the way we put this all together is when Saul had his conversion, he heard the voice of Jesus and he saw Jesus. But the men who were with him, they heard a sound and they saw some light, but they did not hear Jesus specifically. They did not see Jesus specifically. And that's how these two fit together. And again, in the modern versions, it's, it's a little more, uh, it makes more sense. All right. Here's another one for you. Just a moment here. The question is, what exactly was written on the sign that was on the cross of Jesus? And as we read the different Gospels, there seems to be a different version of what was written there. For example, on the book of Matthew 27, 37, above his head they placed the written charge against him, this is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then in Luke 23, 38, it says, there was a written notice above him which, which read, This is the King of the Jews. Then you look at John 19.19. 19. Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened it to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of 
the Jews. And then Mark 15, 26, the written notice of the charge against him read, the king of the Jews. So you see, these are all different. What exactly was written above the cross? This, Matthew says, this is Jesus, the king of the Jews. Luke claimed, this is the king of the Jews. According to John, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. According to Mark, the king of the Jews. <laughs> How is it that there's all these different versions of what was written? Do these contradict each other? Well, if you really remember the whole story, you'll find these don't contradict. They fit together perfectly. And you get that from John 19, 20. Many of the Jews read the sign, for the place that Jesus was crucified was near the city, and the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. So you see, different languages. So uh, Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew was basically written for the Hebrews. That was the audience of that gospel. So the God, Matthew quotes what was written in Hebrew by Pontius Pilate. Uh, Luke quoted the Greek. Remember, Luke himself was uh, half Greek. And John quoted what was written in Latin. And then Mark is the shortest gospel, and he just quoted what was common to all of them. And all of them said the king of the Jews. So that was true as well. So these all fit together wonderfully. Now, then we have the question. On Easter morning, uh, after the resurrection, which women first went to, to the tomb, the Sunday of, of the resurrection? And there's different versions of this. Uh, Matthew 28, 1 says, After the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. But then we see in Mark 16, 1, When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James, and Salome bought spices that they might go anoint Jesus' body. But then, you look at John 20, verse 1. Early on the first day, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb <laughs> and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. But then, in Luke 24, 9-10, but when they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, mother, uh, Mary the mother of James, and the others with them who told the apostles. So it looks like they were all at the tomb. So the question is, which gospel is correct? How many women went to the tomb? How can all these events be true? Well, they actually all can fit together because each gospel focuses on different things. Say there was a big group of you that went to the store. You could say to someone later, you know, this whole group of us went to the store. But say as you went to the store, you were talking to a particular person in the group. Then you could tell someone else, you know, I was talking to so-and-so on, on the way to the store. We went to the store. We, went, we were at the store the other day. And that's true as well. Or maybe three of you were talking. And, and, and you spent, kind of were together in, in the group. And, the th and you could say, well, I, was, I went with so-and-so and so-and-so -and -so to the store. Just mentioning those people that you have to be talking with on the way. That would be true. So all these can fit together. So based on these verses, we know that Mary Magdalene, the other Mary, the mother, Mary mother of James, Salome, Joanna, at least one other woman, most probably went to the tomb. Uh, at least five women went to the tomb. So it's likely there were at least five women that went, maybe more. 
So, but these all can fit together. So that is um, manuscript reliability and showing, and just to show you that as you look at apparent contradictions in the Bible, there are explanations for them that, um, that we can look at. Uh, you can actually find books and websites that if you ever have a, if you ever find a verse that seems to contradict, you can look them up and they, they have a pretty good explanation of what's likely the answer to that. So don't let those things spook you. Uh, as a piece of literature, the Bible has good manuscript reliability and believability. Okay.